Um, thank you very much. Welcome once again to everyone. My name is Sally Fuba. I'm the coordinator of the, or the co-coordinator of the program. Um, we're welcoming you to yet another milestone um, registered by IG Business Finance um, to ensure that finance professionals, um, both within and outside the Gambia, um, are together um, to share skills, to share the knowledge, to share the expertise that they have. And I can assure you that today, before leaving this program, um, people will definitely learn from the seasoned professionals that we, we have as panelists. Um, before, you know, further deliberations, I will like to introduce our host of the program, currently residing in um, Lagos, Nigeria, um, working with the Africa Finance Corporation, who is an FCC as well, holding an MBA. Um, is a guy that have actually registered a lot of successes in the finance professionals in the Gambia before leaving. Prior to his departure to Nigeria, he was working with GT Bank and later with Echo Bank as a deputy CFO and taught so many young Gambians as well on the ACCA professional um, education. And this guy basically wrote a book as well on how to pass professional exams. He's an Amazon bestseller. Welcome, join me to welcome Mr. Ibrahim Sawane, um, the host of the program. Mr. Sawane, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salifu, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ibrahim Sawane, and I'm your moderator tonight. It is important we looked at where we are coming from and where we are going to. In 2012, PwC conducted a research about the effectiveness of finance functions. And they discovered that the management teams or businesses are moving from transaction support to a more decision support. What this mean, those traditional roles or skill sets that help people to grow and become more successful finance professionals are moving away. Business owners, human resources managers, CEOs are looking for finance professionals who can support them to make decisions. Not only do we make a decision, but we need those skill sets that can enable us to sell our views, to share our views with other partners. And here we are calling about business partnering. You can't be an effective business partner if you don't understand the value chain of a company, if, you don't, if you're not commercially acumen. And that's why we founded iGrow Business, which owns the IG Business and Finance brand, with a single purpose of supporting the finance professionals in the sub-Saharan Africa. We believe quite a number of young people completed that first degree in accounting, or they've completed the professional qualifications like ACCA, CFA, or CIMA, whatever. But yet, we still lack some critical skills that are important for us to be successful. And tonight, we were able to get about four people, four young Gambians. They are all made in Gambia. We are proud of that. That are willing to share their time, their experience, and their stories with us. I believe we will learn from these people. Without much ado, please let's meet our panelists tonight. Our first panelist is a, a sister, a friend, and a very well experienced banker and entrepreneur as well. Fatima is a fellow of ACCA. She currently works as a financial advisor in Merrill Lynch, one of the biggest uh, investment bank in the United States. Prior to that, she used to work in Standard Chartered Bank. She worked in Standard Chartered Bank, Gambia, and later she was moved to Standard Chartered Bank, West Africa Hub in Nigeria. She has also worked with GT Bank, Gambia. 
like I say, she's an entrepreneur. She founded her own business, Deep Africa. And she has a very strong skills when you come to commercial awareness, excellent communications, and of course, with the international experience. Fatima, welcome on board. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Next we have for you is Mr. Kaira. Dr. Kaira also is a chartered accountant. Among the panelists, I think he's, I mean, he's the only guy who has worked in government entity as well as work with the private sector. Dada has a very interesting story, but I know he attended a lot of trainings in and out of the Gambia, change management, leadership. He started his professional career with the Pristine Consulting, where he rose from the position of accountant to finance manager for admin and finance. Currently, he serves as the head of finance at Gambia Transport Service Company, that's the CFO, he has a very strong experience and he also does part-time lecturing. Welcome on board, Mr. Kaira. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. We have uh, Madam Nenenjai, also a fellow, well-experienced balance again from public practice <laughs> as in auditing, as well as the internal auditing. Nene has a very strong skills in governance, risks, and control. She is currently the head of audit, you can call it chief internal auditor of Standard Chartered Bank, Gambia, and that has given a lot of opportunity to work with quite a number of group uh, audit activities. She is also a board member of Axon Aid, Gambia. Uh, in fact, the chairman of the board account and treasury committee, if I get the, the committee names right, she has previously worked in Deloitte and Trust. In fact, she was my auditor when I was in Ecobank, Gambia. Welcome on board, Nene. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. We have, last but not the least, Mr. Mas Manjang, a chartered accountant, well experienced finance specialist, particularly in the banking industry. Mas was previously the head of finance at Access Bank Gambia, that's the CFO role. And today he is the CFO of Ecobank Gambia, where he led a lot of strategic initiative as a business partner with the CEO and number of group assignments. Welcome board, Mas. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sawane. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much once again for joining us, my able panelists. And like we said earlier on, the objective of this webinar is for us to share our experience and skill set, particularly with the young finance professionals or those who are intending to study finance, accounting, treasury, banking, auditing, name it. We believe that when we share our stories with them, we'll be able to help them to make their own decisions and learn the right skills that will help them to succeed. So I will start with uh, Mr. Mas Manja. Please, can you tell us a bit what are some of those factors that help you to achieve what you have achieved so far today? Thank you, Sawane, once more. And Good afternoon, fellow panelists. Um, I would say a number of factors. One, um, some of them, of course, I would say uh, coincidence. And what most times, of course, is a lot of hard work and, and focus in terms of what you entail or what, what your goals are in terms of your career ambitions. Um, generally, I, I started off in banking, even though I studied um, a bit of finance, but I majored in economics at, at university and ended up being uh, working for a bank and finance department. So for me, it, what is important is once you find yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a professional setting, meaning you have employment, you should stay focused on what your end goals are. So first is to ensure that you develop the right skills, the right skill set that will take you to what you want, what, what you aspire to be in terms of your career ambitions um, um, for the future. It could be a five-year plan, it could be a 10-year plan. And of course, what that means is you have to um, actually find the right environment and the motivation uh, that would, of course, propel you towards achieving that. 
So, like I said, I, I did start off in, in accounting, but of course, I, I ended up, you know, being a, a finance professional. Um, I had an ambition to be chartered um, um, as, as very, very early on in my professional career. So, of course, we all know um, working in the finance industry is quite um, demanding and actually very, very challenging. And for you to be able to work full time and also do um, some reading um, in terms of career personal development, it would mean you have to put in extra efforts in it. So, of course, there and then I know what I wanted and I knew what I wanted to be in the future. That is, of course, uh, to be um, a CFO um, in, in this one in my career. So, of course, I immediately um, looked into the possibility of um, having an um, AC qualification. So I did some little bit of research and I look at what is practical because I know that I wouldn't be able to take off time work first. First, I don't have the resources to finance myself. But of course, also, you know, I need to have some experience that all towards, you know, also achieving what I wanted to be. So importantly is to, um, like I said, is to find, you know, what you want, number one, and number two, how to get to where you, where you, where you want to be. Of course, once you have these two clear out in your mind, you don't need to set about trying to find the right um, resources and the right environment. Of course, importantly too, is you have to be self-motivated. That is very, very key because if you're not self-motivated, right. there is no way you'll be able to achieve your goals. So that for me has been my driving, um, um, you can call it my driving uh, motivation, my driving desire to be able to um, get to where I want to be. So I stayed focused, putting a lot of extra efforts. Of course, I also carried on my, my job full time all along. So for me, these are very, very um, key things that one should um, take note of. Thank you very much, Matt. I think that's yeah. very critical. The, the key message there is what I call intentional growth. Uh, what is more important for all of us, for us to be able to grow, we have to be intentional about it. And when you are intentional about something, you start preparing a plan. So what Mas is telling us is that he had a plan, he had a goal from day one, and he worked towards those plans. And he had that self-motivation. We can be motivated by different things, but it's important we have that courage, we have that intention that we want to achieve something. Thank you once again, Mas. Uh, let me ask, uh, Fatima, a similar question. Fatima, I know you've, you have a, a very broad experience. You've worked in a number of banks and quite a number of uh, countries as well. I know I didn't talk about everything, whether from Uganda, from UK, Nigeria, Gambia, now in America. So but what do you also think were some of the factors that help you to, to succeed as you, as you grow in your career? Thank you very much. I think for me, it was three main issue things. Number one, be hungry. Learn, 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 no matter who it's from. I remember reaching out to one of the panelists called Nene, and I told her, please teach me. Teach me exactly what you do. And that's what I do for every single person that I meet, regardless whether the person is my subordinate or my boss. Number two, be very comfortable with numbers. You don't have to be scared or intimidated. You, just, you don't even need to be the best in math. But you need to understand that you will have to play and manipulate numbers to get your desired results. So don't be afraid. Be comfortable with numbers. And lastly, be patient. Deadline is important. However, it's not how fast you get work done. It's how well you do it. So make sure that even in regular life, don't rush. Because when you rush, you get to mess up. And you'd have to need, you have the need to go back to do it and end up spending more time to fix it. So be hungry, be comfortable with numbers, and be very patient. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Fatima. Very precise, and they are, again, very critical and important. Without that hunger, I don't think we can change a lot of things in our life. Uh, the motto of Things and Grow Rich said that for anything we need, we must have that burning desire. And that burning desire is very important. I always use my story as an example, I became a chartered accountant because I knew that that situation I was in at that time, I must change it. I wanted to change something I went through. I don't want my kids to go through. Your story may be different. And don't be afraid to ask. Another human being is afraid to ask because we, we have the fear of rejection. But do not think like that. Ask people to help you. She said, she asked people to help her. She gave an example of Nene here. So I think I'll use the opportunity to move to Nene. Nene, you, you have a very diverse background. You've audited quite a, a number of companies, and now you've moved to internal audit in one of the biggest banks, not only in Gambia, but in the globe. So 
what are those things that make you successful? Because audit job is very difficult. If you look at it, most people uh, tend to not tend, they don't want to be friends with auditors because they think that you're just catching thieves or you put people in trouble. How do you manage that you are still able to grow in your career? Okay, thank you very much. Um, like you said, being an external auditor first and then internal auditor is quite a demanding task. Like you've mentioned, uh, if you're not careful, you'll make a lot of enemies along the way because they tend to think that you are there to police them, get them in trouble. But I think the key um, competence that has get it, gotten me through over the years has been my ability to engage effectively with the stakeholders. I always say I am not, I am not here to, to report you. I am not here to police you. But we're here to work together as a team to achieve the overall objectives of the organization, be it whatever it, that, that might be. So definitely communication is, is one of the key skills that you must possess in order to be a successful internal auditor or external auditor. So uh, in addition to that, I'm also a self-developer. So sometimes in an organization, you're, you're stuck in a particular role. Um, the organization might not necessarily push you to develop your career, but you need to take ownership of that career development and do it yourself. Right now, there's so many online courses, so much on the internet. So there's no, no stopping you. I always say you need to have that growth mindset of never settling. You know, look for that expo um, exponential growth in, in, in yourself. And I always say you can do it. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that, that can stop anyone from definitely achieving, achieving their, their dreams. For example, um, I, I can talk a little bit about my career when I was in, in, in Deloitte and Touche. Um, when I started with Deloitte, I was not a chartered accountant. I had my um, BSc graduation in, in accounting. But we all know in the auditing firms, if you are not a chartered accountant, be it ACCA or whatever, you do not get the opportunities to, to grow, so to speak. So I remember joining, joining Deloitte with just my first degree, and I could only be an audit assistant. I could not even be an audit senior. But with that growth mindset, uh, mindset in me, and I knew definitely I wanted to get to the top partner level definitely was my ambition when I got into, into Deloitte. But also knowing that without the ACCA, definitely there was no chance for me to, to grow. So as soon as I realized that, I very quickly went to, I remember very clearly, I went to, I went to MDI one afternoon to inquire about the ACCA program, you know, did all my research and stuff like that. Um, I had a talk with one of the lecturers, and I always say this in any talk that I, that I, that I give, um, Dauda is, is here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the lecturer said to me, if you, want to, if you want to be successful with this ACC, I suggest you join Dauda and his crew. So in as much also as you are determined and you want to achieve something, you always need somebody to motivate you. And for me, Dauda was my motivator. I also remember Chairman Jalo, God rest his soul, and Titi Deloitte. He's also another someone that I looked up to because he also encouraged me to, to, to advance my career. Um, and the moment that I had qualified my ACCA from audit assistant, I was promoted immediately to be an audit manager. So that just shows you, if you grow yourself, do the job right, definitely there's, there's room for you to, to grow. But most importantly, I wanted to talk briefly on the work-life balance, which is also very important. Because in as much as you carry out the responsibilities to the best of your abilities, you, you, you do the work, you develop yourself. You also need to have time for your family, you need to have time to pray, and you need to rest. So that is also very important in as much as you want to build your career. Wow, Th thank you very much, Nene. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, you've, you've had three people so far, three of our panelists, and they've shared with us very strong experience and personal stories. These are things you probably would not learn in a textbook in school. And I don't think I can remember during my ACC where day, somebody was telling me about work-life balance. We had thought about accounting, how to balance books, but not work-life balance may be there, but it was not a focus of the, of the subject. So far, so good. They shared very strong view with us. If you have any question for the meantime, you can send them to our group chat, to, to chat function. Now we'll move to 
Mr. Kaira, Dada Nene mentioned your your name as one of those people she was sharing notes with who motivated her. And I believe in it a lot. And she also mentioned about Chono, late Chono Jallo. Chono also was a motivator for me. I remember when she used to be, I mean, he used to be our audit partner at Echo Bank then. When I told him I was studying ACC, he was very happy and shared a lot of things with me. But in terms of mentoring, did how was mentoring for you, either you mentor somebody or you have been mentored, did it help your career growth, Mr. Kaira, particularly moving from private sector to public sector? Did mentoring help you? Um, yes. Good afternoon to you all from wherever you are. Um, it did. Um, I'm surprised that Nene said I, 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 I mentored. <laughs> I thought it would be the other way around. So, uh, But anyway, um, it, it, it helped a lot. And uh, because I, I had to be mentored, mentored by others as well. And uh, I think to be successful in this field, you really need to have a passion for, the, for, the, for, for finance because it starts from loving it, believing that, you know, it's, it's, it's your area. And then you begin to develop from there. But if you don't have a passion for it, if you have no reason for choosing finance, so the chances are that, there is a uh, the, uh, that you would not go much. Uh, you will not go far. Um, so it starts from there. That's going to be the force. But dedication is very important too. I think um, um, whatever you do in life, as long as you know it's something that is very useful to you and to society, you need to um, be very dedicated. And uh, patience. Uh, one of my colleagues have said it too. Um, you cannot just force your way up there. Um, otherwise, even if you get there, you will be half-baked and um, you may not be um, as productive or be ready for the position that you are assuming. So um, you really need to exercise the patience that it requires for you to go through the qualification and the experience required to assume the position that you want to assume or you're currently assuming. So um, that requires a lot of patience. And um, as a finance guy, one thing that should be in our DNA, all of us, is we should be um, um, result-driven. Um, you, need, you, need, you need to be motivated by the desire to see results, positive results, outcomes. Um, that's one um, attribute that every intending successful person in this area should have. So um, um, I think these are very important. Um, you need to also have the right people around you. Um, I think um, Nene is right in the sense that we did a lot together, not in the sense that I mentored her. She mentored me probably. But yes, we mentored each other. But the point is we had a good um, group. You know, you need to be able to identify those people that have similar objectives with you and uh, you exchange ideas, you work together, you push one another, that is very important. So you cannot aspire to be a successful person in finance, yet you don't have the right people around you. So I believe all these are very um, important um, um, things that must be borne in mind for persons that want to succeed. And I think um, these are the factors that contributed to getting me uh, to where I am. So I hope I would be successful. Um, that's it. This, this is just the beginning of your success, Mr. Kaira, because you've mentioned about some critical points, which sometimes I look at it, they are lacking in the Gambia. That is networking. You need people around you that you can consult. You are not expected to know everything, whether you are a CEO or CFO. What you need is a group of people that you can call upon any time you need to clarify something or you want to share your views with. You may need somebody, it can be a doctor. You may need somebody, it can be somebody in sales, somebody in credits, somebody in audit, someone you can call upon to see your views with. So that networking is very, very important. And as young people, we need to find a way of doing that as we are growing. You should not wait till you are the CFO or you are the head of audit or the CEO. Whilst you are growing, build that network of people that are going to be valuable to you. Because they said your network is your net worth. Okay, I will go back to uh, Mars. Mars, you've been a CFO of two banks in the Gambia. And I know the role of CFO often requires us to take tough decisions. Sometimes you have to tell people no to what they want. And yet, 
You want to be seen as a business enabler, as a CFO. How do you handle tough situations when you are faced with uh, situations like that, particularly with your business partners in the business sectors? Mr. Manja. Thank you so much. I think this is um, something that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis in our roles as, as finance professionals. Like you rightly said, it is a tough balancing act to do. Like at the same time, you want to, um, as one of our um, key, key attributes too, is we have to have good interpersonal skills, like you rightly said. But we also have to be in a position where when the tough decisions are to be made, some most times, more often than not, the CEO will rely on the CFO to, to make those tough calls. Okay, so like someone once told me a long time ago, it's not a popularity contest. If you want to be highly popular, this is not the role for you. <laughs> so it's, 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 it is something that generally as a person, I have encountered this um, throughout my career. But I think coming back to your question, um, what you need to, what, what are some of the things that you could rely on when those um, situations do arise? Um, is, is, is actually to look at the bigger picture. For, for me, it's in decision making, when it comes to decision making, first and foremost, I look at what's good for the organization. Uh, because in as much as uh, we are all there, what we are looking at, we are trying to increase the value of the organization first and foremost, that is the shareholder value. But of course, we also, as part of our role also is to be fair, because we are also, as part of the finance role too, is, let's say, for example, is performance management. We do, all, we, that's also a key component of what we do. And that we all know is a highly charged area because um, as a business partner, for instance, uh, you are in a position, you are like an arbitra where, you sort of make policies, you come up with policies and you make decisions that will affect people's careers. Okay, you make decisions that will affect what goes into people's pocket. So if you are too sentimental or too emotional about issues, you might not be able to make those tough calls. And another the day, the job will not be done or the end goal in this aspect on this particular situation may not lead to the desired results. So it's first and foremost is to have some guiding principles. And those guiding principles for me should be embedded within the company strategy. Okay, first and foremost. But also as an individual, you should also be governed by strong ethical um, guidelines as a person in your day-to-day -day relationship with people. Okay, you of course have to be conscious of the impact that your decision will have on other people. Okay, but on the day two, you have to also balance that with what are you trying to achieve with this um, particular situation that you have um, I'm, I'm faced with. So for me, three things are, are key. You have to be guided by what the company goals are in terms of what are the aspirations of the company that you work for, what are your own personal ethical principles that guide you as, a, as, as an individual, okay? But also, too, you also have to use a lot of communication skills. You should be able to rely on your communication skills to articulate the reason why you make certain decisions, because that is very, very important. It is important that you engage with the people that your decision would have an impact on. I think once that communication is done rightly, even though someone might affect it negative or adversely by your decision, but that person would, um, you know, even though it's, it's human, you would, post, you would you would feel it that, okay, whatever decision you have taken, I am at the losing end. But I think once you're able to engage them early on and continue to communicate, even that after the decision is taken, I think down the line, they will come back and say, after all, I think you did the right thing. So I think these are some key things that you should, one can um, use as some guiding. Um, principles that now um, th th thank you very much uh mr manjan uh, mas manjan the cfo of ecobank gambia when a cfo talks you know a cfo is talking he he spoke about a much <laughs> bigger view he, talk, he spoke about strategy he said you look at beyond what you are looking at at that moment we don't take decisions based on emotions at that moment we looked at what is good for the company and for us to know what is good for the company we need a strategy to be in place that's the much bigger view. A CFO should be thinking like the CEO. That decision I'm taking, how will it impact other strategic goals? Will it add value to the shareholders or will it, is it going to create wastage in the company? And of course, he mentioned the fact of communication. We have to learn how to communicate and we have to communicate in the right way when we are talking to other stakeholders as finance professionals. That would take me to Fatima. I know Fatim is, she has a very strong skill in communication, relationship management. In fact, she has even joined the Toastmasters platform to improve her communication and leadership skills. But Fatima, I want to hear from you. How important has communication been 
in terms of managing relationships with other people within the business environment? As uh, financial advisors and planners, crunching numbers and analyzing operational success, as reflected by the data, is a critical component of our business system. And not everybody understands numbers. We are considered boring, just too much of a non-social personality, and people simply just do not understand us or our numbers. Therefore, it is critically important to get everybody on board with strategies based on whatever data we have. And that means that we have to ensure that the information that we are communicating is effectively brought out in a timely manner. So it's all about bridging the gap between individuals and groups and the flow of information. You do save lives, enhance business performances, and make jobs easy when the people are well informed. Now, anybody can talk at any point in time, but not many people can communicate. When you say something to someone and a person comes back to you and asks, what do you mean? you did not communicate. What you did was slow the process, mess somebody's time, and time is money in our world, so you spent someone's time currency. There are things, these are things that you do not want to be associated with. As a financial expert, you should be able to explain your trends, your patterns, forecast in a very clear and coherent manner. These explanations should be concise, information laden, because executives often are too busy to read long, reports. So learn to summarize, even if it means that it will take you one hour to make one email for, into four lines. Over time, you will get better, and that one hour will turn into one minute. When you write emails, no one has the time to read, hello, ma, how is your family? How are the village people? A simple, I hope you're keeping well, and a few lines would definitely work. My principle is imagining that you're an elevator with a management, he's going to the third floor, and you have a few seconds to clearly explain what you want to communicate. So number one, know your audience. Number two, simplicity is sweet. Avoid jargons, abbreviations. Trust me, you don't look smart when you use big words. And use tables, graphs, and colors should be your best friend. Wow, thank, thank you very much. That, that's the whole lectures on communication classes. These are very important tips you just shared with us. I've, I've seen quite a number of people who can't communicate. I've seen people sweating under the AC. Yes, there is AC, and they ask them to come and present because they have that fear of communication. And that's why it is important as a finance professional, you find a way of improving your communication, both presentation and written communication. When you become a CFO, you may be required to come and present to the board. We know some CFOs who have been moved to become CEOs. We know some CFOs who have been asked to come and present to regulators or any other party. So it's important as you are growing within your finance career, you learn how to communicate. Her job daily is she advise thousands of people how to manage their money. People come with different problems in terms of money point of view and how work is to make them to understand what she wants them to achieve from that limited resources they have. I will use the opportunity and move to Mr. Kaira. Communication we just spoke about is something I know we do not often learn in school. They will tell us communication is important, but there are very few schools that will teach you as an accountant how to communicate. We often acquire this kind of skills through personal development. And I know you as in person, you believe in personal development. You have done a lot of courses on personal development, leadership, change management, both within and outside the Gambia. A number of people stop learning after having their ACC qualification, CMA, CFA, or any other qualification, or even their BSc or master's. For you, how important is personal development for a finance professional, a continuous personal development? Mr. Kaira. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I, I, I believe um, learning is a process rather than a project. Um, if you consider it a project, then um, there would come a time when it, you think it's it's over. So um, I think um, it may have um, different chapters. The ACCA could be a chapter of its own that would be a project, the AAT and whatever. But every point in time, you should realize that there is an open chapter that gives you the opportunity to learn. I've already learned a lot a couple of minutes ago to now. So it has to be a continuous process rather than a project. So you, you don't rest after ACCA. But coming back to the importance of this, um, the reality is that um, we are always moving. 
um, we are ninety percent of people are moving. You and and probably ten percent or even less are always where they are. So it the question becomes: Which direction are you moving? You're either progressing or retrogressing. From the time, for example, I qualified to now, if I decided that I would not move any step further, not develop myself, probably I might have been good enough to uh, meet the demands of then. But as long as I'm not able to meet the demands of today, then I technically I retrogressed. I did not progress. So I may think that I am where I am, but I'm actually moving behind because there is a gap between the expectation and what I can deliver. So, and that's the reality about everyone. So the importance of learning is that you need to move but forward. Because if you don't learn, you are not where you are but moving behind because there is expectation, the, the gap would widen further and further. And I think as a professional, um, um, it's just ethical to, 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 to learn continuously because if you claim to be able to do what you're doing, you have to um, um, develop yourself. Otherwise, a time would come when you wouldn't be able to deliver um, what the position or job requires, and um, that is very unethical. So besides the fact that um, you need to do so to, to deliver, to live up to expectation, it is just the right thing to do, and um, it, is, it, is, it is very ethical. If you look at the IFAD or ACCA Code of Ethics, it requires that we, 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 have, we remain professionally competent and um, that requires that we, we we are up to date with regulations and so on that that that, that affects how we do our work or that influence the environment within which we operate. So um, um, you either learn or at some point the this the pace of change nowadays at some point you become less relevant or irrelevant. Wow. Thank you very much. I, I just noticed you say you either learn or it just remind me of uh, there used to be a professor at the University of the Gambia, Professor Owozu. He once used to say in academic environment, it's either you either publish or you perish. So it's like similar thing in career growth and development, is you either learn or you technically you're going to perish because things are changing. We've seen quite a massive changes happening in the industry. Today, we have financial technologies. We need new skills, digital skills, communication, business partnering. These are things that you probably haven't learned. When we are going to school, like I said, we didn't learn these things. But during this lockdown, I've taken over three different courses. I took a course on leadership and management because I want to sort of be updated on what is happening in the research fields. I've, I took a course on Python. That's the programming language because I want to be able to analyze data. I took a course about data science too not to be a specialist in data, but as a finance person, I want to understand how data science can help me to improve decision making support I'll be giving to my executives. So that's why I took a course on these various areas of the business. So everyone who wants to grow needs to look at this area and it does not matter. It does not matter what kind of work you do. What is more important, you have to be prepared to grow. And for that to happen, you have to learn. He said, that earlier is not a project. Learning is not a project because a project has a beginning and ending. We should continue to learn till we leave this world. That's what life is about because it even funders your, your mind, your brain. It's very good to learn. You can learn something about psychology. You can learn something about, uh, I mean, different worlds that you, you've heard about, but it's important you learn. I will move to my sister, Nene. Nene did spoke about something very profound area which has to do with work-life balance and the area we are in we are in the emerging market africa gambia sometimes it's a bit challenging for our female colleagues sisters mothers and and there are very few women in finance it's a global problem and particularly in gambia i know very few accountants so she is one of those people who have grown from audit manager all the way to be a chief auditor of an international bank. So then you want to share with us as a, as a, I don't want to say as a woman, but I would say as a female colleague and counterparties, what would you share with them? How you are able to succeed among an industry that was known for, the, for, the, for, for men. And up to today, we have quite a number of accountants in Gambia are, are, are male counterparts. <clears throat> 
thank you. Uh, I think you hit the hill, uh, the nail right, right in the head. To be honest, um, finance is a male-dominated field. Same with internal audit, um, external audit. Um, anywhere you go to, it is the men, so to speak. I don't mean to <laughs> to be anything else, but it is the men that you see sitting at the table. So for me, particularly, um, one of my commitments has always been to make sure that I'm always seated at that table. So it is important to kind of um, break from that mindset that it is a male-dominated um, field because women can sit on the table, women can be heard, and we are being heard right now, actually. So, I mean, the doors are opening, so we should also take this opportunity to definitely make use make use of it. So first and foremost, I would like to say I am super proud of any woman that is trying to pursue a career in finance because most of the time you're being dis um, discouraged because at an early age in our life, we are thought to be submissive. We are thought to be not to be um, overachievers. You know, you are taught to be, I mean, you are just a, a homemaker. Let me, let me just be honest. But to be honest, we can have it all. It is not either your family or your career. You can have both. Um, and I say with humility that over the years, I've been able to achieve that. And one of the key things in being able to achieve that is never be afraid to ask for help. Because to be honest, we cannot do it all. So you need that support. And that support from my friends, from my family, from my colleagues has been very instrumental um, in, in I mean, taking my career to where it is before. Um, I also want to thank my dad specifically. So I always say when a woman succeeds, definitely there is somebody behind them. We, we always say um, there's a woman behind a man, but there's also always a man behind a woman. My dad has been very instrumental in that because I was never taught to be um, in one corner to say I can't do it. So he let me have the mindset or the thought process to say I can do whatever a man can do. Um, in addition to that, my husband has been also very supportive over the years in letting me also pursue my career. So that is also very, very important. But having said that, I believe there's no limitations um, in achieving what you set out to achieve. Most of the time, it is also self-limitations. Um, we self-limit ourselves. We doubt ourselves. But we need to shift that aside. Um, right now, women need to aspire to be women in the finance world. We need to continuously strive to identify ways to make yourself more visible. You need to be relevant. And most importantly, you need to be courageous. Courageous enough to challenge and question any lack of information in any forum that you sit in. So sometimes we are the we as women also need to create that space for other women to be part of the table or to join the table for their voices to be heard. So if we're not allowing other women to come in as well, then it defeats the whole purpose. So please, please, um, one advice that you take from me, if nothing else, is let us be courageous enough to challenge the status quo that it is a male-dominated field. It no longer is. <laughs> That's what I would say. So I am married. I have three boys, I mean, who I'm trying to raise to the best of my ability to be God-fearing, to, be, to, be, to make the world a better place, to be honest. And I'm doing that at the same time I'm, I'm succeeding in my career as well. Uh, if I look at it, motherhood has been one of my biggest ach achievements. In as much as I've achieved career-wise, but motherhood has been the biggest achievement. And I was able to do that, and of course, with the support of many other people around me. So again, don't be afraid to ask for help if you need the help, because people are willing to share and support for you to, to, to move along in your career. Wow. Th th thank you very much, Nene. You just, uh, I don't know if you realize that you have three jobs. <laughs> at the same time, you have three jobs because you have a job as Standard yeah. Bank as head of audit. You have a job to manage your partner as your yeah. husband. You have a job to manage three boys. Me, I'm managing one boy in my house. It's been difficult. So when you say you have three boys, I just have to salute you for, for doing that. I mean, because the truth is, there are so many kids out there who have mothers, they have fathers, but they lack parents. So I feel proud when you said you are balancing these two, your profession, as well as your family. Whilst you want to grow, we should be thinking about this as well. Or else in the future, we will see the effect on those children. It's the responsibility of both parents, that's the mother and the father. And in terms of growth, 
it is important women come on the table under that big table. It has been proven so many times that diversity helps, so that we don't think. Men has ways of thinking. Women have a way of thinking, and it's not one after the other. You can't sacrifice and say, "Okay, I need men. I don't need women." Yeah, it has never worked. This is something scientific, nothing to do with culture, nothing to do with uh, emotions. It has been proven that when we put our minds together, companies who have more women on their board at that senior management level tend to make more money than those who are few. Google about it. McKinsey and a lot of big firms have done this kind of research. And I'm also happy that you are encouraging young women to take more responsibilities and roles in finance. And they have to ask for it. It's important. But the, the, uh, the guys who are also leading, it's important we create those spaces and look at somebody in the institution, try to share a few things with them that can encourage them, help them to grow as well. Because without them, we can never have a balanced system anywhere in our organization. So before you move to Q&A, since time has well spent with just 10 minutes to wrap up, I want to ask uh, Mr. Manja one more question. Mr. Manja, it was Jack Wells, the former CEO of GE, who they said once said that when, before you become a leader, growth, everything is about you. And when you become a leader, the growth is about people below you. I just want to see how do you manage the development and growth of people in your team as a CFO? How do you manage that, Mr. Manja? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wani, on that. Um, as a young CFO, one of the young CFOs in the industry, I think I find this especially very, very important um, to have this um, as one of your key um, drives, drivers, because a lot of people, um, know it or not, look up to you. And, and of course, they want to grow. Um, they want to grow. So for me, importantly, like you rightly said, um, as quoted from Jack Wells, is um, you, you have to be selfless, okay, um, in terms of um, empowering the people that you work with um, to be able to grow. Um, I know I find this more often than not, I, I find myself in sort of um, a dilemma, okay, because you have diet deadlines that are due and, you know, it requires people putting in extra hours to be able to deliver on those deadlines, but also you have um, colleagues out there who also want to develop themselves, who are also pursuing um, um, causes like ACCA. How, how, as a leader in this respect, how do you um, strike that balance, okay? So for me, importantly, um, what, what I do, um, this is just typically what I have, have, have handled it, um, is to accommodate um, in terms of how, um, how do we um, uh, sort of um, take, you know, because for me, the important thing here is growth. You know, as much as there's job to be done, there is also important that for people to be able to um, grow into their careers. That way, that can also um, serve as a motivation. So what I encourage um, 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 colleagues of mine who are also very relatively young team that I have, I'm working with currently, and I think two of them are still pursuing um, their, 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 their qualifications, is that we, uh, what I tell them is my personal story, that I've been able to do this whilst having a full-time job, okay? If I'm able to do it, I'm not smarter than you are. You are also able to do this. So I give them some tips like, how do you put in an extra hour? For instance, you can work for, for an eight-hour job, right? But you may need to stay two hours extra or three hours extra to do your own personal reading, okay, after working hours. Over a weekend, to be able to also at the same time be able to do your necessary course. So also when it comes to leave arrangements too, because uh, you also need time out sometimes when there are um, 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 exams are due, uh, are coming up. So one way of also doing this, of course, to utilize your, in as much as the organization may have some limited number of maybe days that they will give you as an exam leave, but you can also make use of your own annual leave. Because for me, the important thing like um, is, is, is been shared all along is you have to put in um, a lot of, um, you have to you have to stay focused, but also you also want to have you have to have that will in you, that internal burning desire that you want to achieve this. So if you have that, importantly, I think you'll be able to make some sacrifices to be able to get to your end goal. So it requires a lot of sacrifice. You may not go on your regular leave like everybody or person will do because during your leave you might want to use that to study. So for me, those are some of the things that I share with um, young um, colleagues of mine that are still pursuing. Um, that way they are able to also um, stay focused on their careers and be able to develop 
um, themselves so that they can um, quickly take over from me because I think I, I need to also move on. So those are some of the motivations that I, I do tell them on a day-to-day basis that you need to come and step up so that you can replace me. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's very good, Mr. Manja. And, and well said that it is important for leaders to support the people below us that our colleagues to help them to grow we can do that by delegating some responsibilities to them. We can send them on assignment on special projects, as well as we support them in their educational goals. And if mentioned something, which they also have to take some sacrifice. I remember when I was doing my CAT and ACCA, I, about five years, I've never taken an annual leave to relax. Anytime I take leave, it means I have exams coming. I will use the official five days my employer gave me, probably at another two or three weeks only, depending on the work environment. That we, of course, we have to balance use these things, and go and study. I did everything through self-study. And I believe it is possible for everyone. Anyone can do it. But you have to have that sort of uh, internal burning desire that you want it for you to move to your next level. We have to grow. And those who are the CFO roles have to think that we have to grow to the next level. It can be a CEO. It can be any other institution. But you cannot grow if people below you are not growing, we shouldn't be seeing them uh, as a competitor. We should help them for them to grow because when they understand what they are doing, it increases productivity. It helps all of us to focus on the most strategic things, the most important things. We will now move to question and answers session. I think we have about a few minutes more left. Mr. Salif, do you have, have you received any questions on your side? Yes. Um... Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ibrahim. Yes. Um, insightful discourse. And I think there is a question from Pal Malik, okay. um, which reads, how easy or difficult it is to learn finance using Gambian's financial data? Um, probably. Okay. How easy it is difficult to learn Gam yeah, uh, finance, learn finance, finance using Gambia's financial data? Probably he can explain more, or if you can get sense out of the question. Okay, so, I mean, uh, Pamalik, are you online? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I was thinking if you wanted to add more, but okay, since Pamalik is uh, probably not online, but from what I get from this question, how easy for one to learn about finance using the Gambian financial data? Yeah. So if I put that into context based on my knowledge of him, as in as my knowledge of Pamalik, he's, he's a very keen person who wants to learn about data science. And if you want to do a data science, we share some projects together. He too is based in Nigeria here. So for you to learn data science, you need some information from the market. And one of the challenges we have in Gambia is lack of data. For instance, we learn in school how to analyze financial statements. But it is difficult to see the records of many Gambian companies because they are private companies, they are listed, for you to sort of apply that life knowledge on those companies and have a view, which is localized view. Compared to if you are giving a, a, a case study, which is purely based on a US company or an American company. Again, from the research point of view, in America and in the UK and other developed countries, people at the tertiary institutions like university, they will do a case study. They will probably go and study. Let's say you go and study about their GNPC. You now know what makes GNPC successful in certain areas. Is it customer service? Or you go and study Gamtier. And that case study is now available for people to now connect. But the case studies you probably learn in school are mostly case studies that relate to UK companies. So it's easy. You can have a general knowledge. But when you come to localizing that knowledge, you need to have some experience working with somebody to share those knowledge with you. And I hope we've uh, answered that question for, for, for you, Mr. Mr. Ba. Any other question, uh, Salim? Um, not yet from the participants, but I have a question for Mr. Kaira. Okay. Um, yes. I think during your intro, you did mention that he is one of the few that has actually you know, move from public to private sector as right. as accountant. Um, knowing fully that there are a lot of people who are in the public sector right now and probably want to move and to the private sector, and some from the private sector want to move. How did he manage the transition? 
as a professional accountant from public to private sector? Um, uh, firstly, I think, um, yes, most people do uh, um, think that um, GTSC is a, um, um, it's not a, it's a public um, enterprise, but actually it's a private company. Um, it's, it is a subsidiary of, uh, of social security, of course, but operating as a private company. But um, it's, it's, um, <coughs> it's not a difficult thing to um, transition from a private sector enterprise to um, even the public sector, because as a professional, you need to be um, dynamic. You need to fit into different cultures, whatever the culture is. Um, as long as there is a there is a place for a finance professional, um, you need to be dynamic enough to fit in. Um, so um, it wasn't necessarily um, a difficulty per se to 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 settle down um, from um, probably I would say a technology company to a transport company. Maybe I will put it that way um, because I, I, I they they both um, private sector organizations. They both um, 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 have this profit orientation and so on and so forth. But like I said, it's 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 as a professional, these are things that are just um, um, challenges. But if you're dynamic enough, you should be able to um, acculturate easily. So, thank you very much, Mr. Kaira. I think that's. I mean, I'm just learning that uh, the transport company actually is not a is not an SOE. Thank you very much for that, Clarence. I have a question here. I think okay. this one goes to Nene. And I have a question. The participant is asking, how can a woman reach a level of success given the sector gender gap, especially among leadership? How can a woman reach a level of success given the sector gender gap, especially among leadership? So basically, I think what the person is trying to ask is what can young women in particular, the young girls, what can they do to also grow to the level you have achieved? Because today you are part of the sexual leadership we are talking about. Okay, thank you very much. I'll take that. Um, one of the key things I would say is to always, to always put your hand up. I'll give you an example. If a position becomes vacant in any institution, if a woman is looking at the requirements of the position, if they can do nine out of 10 out of the requirements, they will be like, oh, I can only do nine out of 10, so I'm not going to apply. Whereas if a man looks at the objective, I mean, the job descriptions and realizes, oh, I can do seven out of 10, they go ahead and apply. So sometimes it is the unbiased or biased nature of the way our society runs. That is why maybe females are not where they, 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 they should be. But if you can do nine out of 10 or even eight out of 10, be it seven out of 10, put your hand up and say, yes, I want to apply for this position. And then you might, you might have, because a guy with seven out of 10 would probably apply for the job and get the job. So we are also limiting ourselves in that area. Um, another key thing that I would say is also as women, we need to be, we need mm -hmm. to be, uh, we need to be biased consciously also. Mm. Uh, if I am a leader and I am a female, I want to also encourage female talent to, to, to grow. But as leaders, sometimes we are more worried about um, maybe she'll get pregnant, so she'll have to be on maternity for six months. Whereas if I employ a guy, he'll be, he'll be here for, the, for that time. So we need, to be, we need to take that bias out of the equation. And also as leaders, encourage more women to apply for, for leadership roles. Right. And then again to the women, don't, don't, don't self-limit yourself. Go, go for it. I always say never, say, never say, no, I can't do this. I say, say yes, and then figure it out later. How am I going to do this? I like that, Nene. And I think I would just add on to that. You've said it all. One thing I need to let you guys know is that an African woman is a very strong, intelligent, bold, and beautiful being. They're full of missions and dreams, but then they're also full of obstacles and hurdles like any other woman around the world. But I will not downplay your struggles. I know that we do have challenges, but everybody does have challenges, whether you're a woman or a man. My advice is, number one, do not allow excuses to remove your thoughts. 
if there's anybody that can do it, it's definitely you. When I reached out to management to get a raise, I was told I was pregnant for my triplets. So they assumed I don't need, I need time to hold on. I was told yeah. I need time to hold on. And I told them my stomach does not do the job. My head and my I worked so hard, I even had a miscarriage during work. I lost one of my babies. And of course, my husband was mad <laughs> and barred me from work. I gave birth to twins and management said, you need time. So there's, we have an international job, but you cannot go because I know you just gave birth. My take is, I still have kids and I'm still coming to work. It's the same thing whether I'm in Gambia or Nigeria. The kids do not come with me to work. So do not give yourself excuses. Know your worth. Do not compromise a great pay. I've missed out on so many big roles because of a lower pay. I was still a trainee dealer. I, I was approached four times to be a head of department with a very low pay. I still say no. But for you to be able to say no, you have to be in a position to negotiate. So number one, get your acts right. Get your basics right. Start with the right course and that the course that will stand the test of time. So as a woman, you don't have the time to do AAT, TTT, BTT, then ACC. Jump into it and do it. Number two, get your skills right. Learn IT, join Toastmasters, do presentations, and help your boss with his work. You will learn a lot doing that. Number three, engage into forums like this. Be engaging. Ask as many questions as you can. These are free forums that you could pay $20,000 for, but you have it free. Get it. Number two, four, last almost towards the end, get a mentor. We were, when we were born, someone has to teach us, and we continue learning from others. Get a mentor. Lastly, remember, each, each one teach one. Always pay forward. Now, like Nene said, when you know it, teach somebody. Somebody taught you, you're a dead meat if you do not teach what you know. What's in your head will not benefit anybody. So each one, teach one. However, lastly, one thing that you should always know as fellow ladies is that you do not have to be tough or bold like a man to be respected or heard. Be feminine, be positive, and always remain professional at all times. Wow. Thank you very much, yes. Fatima, for, for that wonderful explanation. It, it just reminds me of uh, a lady by the name Carla Harris. I don't know if you've ever heard of her name. I uh, think she's an MD at Morgan Stanley. Also, she wrote a book trying to advise women. One of the tips she gave was that when men are on the higher table, they talk. Sometimes what they talk does not always make sense. Sometimes they even repeat what somebody said. One guy will talk, for instance, Salvin may talk and explain a concept. And a brand will come and get, okay, in other words, what he was saying, he just wanted to be hard to make him look like he's intelligent. But he's saying what Salvin said, and it's not telling to what he was saying. These are some of the tricks you may also have to adopt. You don't have to always be quiet because you don't have anything. If you keep quiet, people will not know you exist. People will not be giving you a challenge. They will not know what you have in your mind. You go to that management meeting, ask a brilliant question. Make a smart comment. Somebody will see you one day and challenge you with a much bigger responsibilities, either inside or outside the organization. Salvi, please proceed with your question. Um, yes, I will recognize the presence of Madam Chilel and my able boss, Mr. Swa from Lomi. Um, and he asks, what in, your, what, in your opinion, can be done to improve participation of finance professionals in the Gambia? Um, he's throwing this question to the to the to, to the panelist. Um, Mas, you want to try that one? Yes, I think I think uh, for me, essentially, it will all boil down to um, networking and organizing forums like this. Uh, because, like you said, we I think generally we have a good number of um, accountants um, in the country, but. Of course, our most times. Of course, I also am aware that we have uh, Jika um, that are also coming, um, sort of a platform which is trying to bring together um, chartered accountants in sort of an association where we could interact and, and share. Uh, no, Jika exists, and also within industry too, there are associations like in banking, which I'm very much familiar with. We also have our own association of CFOs. Um, but everything boils down to uh, networking and also organizing um, events. Like we can have events wherein, um, for example, um, we, we all know what um, is happening right now in terms of COVID-19. So events like the impact of COVID-19 on businesses in the Gambia, for instance, 
you know, could be organized by individuals or through associations, which will bring stakeholders together. That way, I think that would also um, sort of help in terms of um, bringing finance professionals to the forefront in terms of national debates, and uh, even in terms of the uh, developments at the country level, in terms of even the constitution, how does the constitution affect uh, accountants or, or, or finance professionals, because we are also stakeholders. So I think we could be more prominent or, or, or come to the fore in terms of national um, debates, or, 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 or as the case may be, in terms of industry practices by coming out and organizing things that would um, sort of be a platform where people would show interest and know what we are also doing. And of course, um, we are doing great things, but, but I think the, um, the visibility is a bit lacking still, and we need to really work on that to be able to actually come to um, the platform. Thank, thank you very much, Mars. That's a, a wonderful viewpoint. And these are some of the reasons why we set up a, a farm that aims to support young people in developing their skills. But apart from helping people to develop their skills, we want to ensure that we help the accounting profession in the country. We want to work with Giga. Uh, I think two years ago, we organized a breakfast session with Giga, and quite a number of accounting firms came there to support us. Both public uh, accounting firms, as well as some uh, private companies as well, came to support us. And April, we organized an event on the impact of COVID-19 which was facilitated by Mr. Sua and Ecobank Group. And we also did something on accounting point of view as well. And we plan to do more of this, but like C rightly asked the question, it is important we looked at the national level, how best we can sort of support efforts like this for us to work together as professionals, because the profession has changed. I've been in Nigeria for over eight years. I've attended quite a number of conferences here organized by ACCA, or Nigerian ICANN body where we sit and discuss tax changes. We talk about corporate governance. We talk about fintech. We talk about change management. Anything that's happening, even this COVID-19, we have done something with the with uh, ACC and other partners as well. We've done conferences in and outside the country. All this is for us to put our minds together. It is not enough for us to sit in silos and thinking that I have it, then we are okay. If it does not affect you, it's going to affect the next generation. And what I always keep on asking myself, and I believe anybody who is a chartered accountant, who is a finance professional in the country should start thinking, what is it that we are going to hand over to the next generation of accountant? I think we should think purposely beyond the amount of salaries or the job satisfaction we receive. We should look as human beings, we are here to impact other people's lives. And every profession has that. I feel jealous in the positive way when I see the lawyers are doing something great in the country now, they have their own bar. And this, I believe, the accounting profession was there before the, the legal profession, in the sense of from the constitution point of view, that my, my belief is it may not be right, but I believe we are more active than we could have before the legal profession. But we have not achieved some of those things, and we must come together, work with JIGA, work with government, to see how best we can support the young people who are coming up. Because without us, people will not come from the foreign land to help to teach our people what they, we want them to know. Or else, if our oil truly starts coming, we will see a lot of foreign CFOs to be <laughs> CFOs of our oil. We have to look at this oil. <laughs> we must take it seriously. Okay, any questions? Uh, if I, a, a, question, a question for Madam Fatu. Um, Fatu, um, I want you to help the young Gambian finance professional sitting out there who is today um, listening that Fatu is in the US, making her presentation, working with one of the best firms there. Um, what was your secret and how do you maneuver based on the CV that is mentioned? How did you maneuver to leave um, the Gambian soil to the diaspora to make your name? How did you manage to make it out there? What is the secret, please? The main secret is God. Always pray. Always make sure you wake up in the middle of the night and say your prayers. Anything you ask him, he will provide as long as you do your best. I remember when I was in the Gambia, I would contact any single person. Remember, I said, be hungry. I remember going to Nene and said, Nene, I want to know what you do in your department. I need you to teach me. And I would literally pest her up every single time. And I did that for every single department head. 
Because at some point I want to be the CEO. And for me to be the CEO, I need to be able to have at least an idea of every department. And I was a trainee dealer by then. You can imagine how ambitious I was. I contacted the head of department for every single department in Standard Chartered when I was in Gambia. I, anyone in Sierra Leone, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, the US and France, I made it very clear what my intentions were, the fact that I need to move on. I was clear and concise. I sent emails, made various calls to CEOs and made sure that I had a conversation with any visitor that came to Gambia, any visitor that is from the head. People laughed at me when I bought guest lunch. I invited them for dinner. I even offered to take them out just to build rapports. Of course, as a woman, you would have to double up your level of professionalism, not to look so desperate and also not to seem seductive. Having said that, however, you can get international experiences with your indig indigenous settings. And prior to me saying that, I remember even with Merrill when I was in Nigeria, I remember Ibrahima saw my struggles. I had issues within my household and yet I needed to move to an organization. I looked at the organization and I reached out to Merrill's team, reached out to a manager there and then explained to them what I wanted. It always works. Now, your goal is to organize your mindset to have an international practice as a benchmark. Since not everybody has a chance to travel, I have seen people who have been in one country learning in the same opportunities I did. So number one, read more about the international space, mirror the look and behavior and speech style of the person you're looking up to. Remember, we now live in a global village. The world has no boundaries. Look at your LinkedIn status and make sure it reflects what you want to project. Most importantly, get a mentor. I cannot stress that enough. Get a mentor. We cannot do it alone. I have three mentors. I go back to them like babies, go back to their mother when they don't have ice cream. I ask them questions like nothing before. A friend of mine once told me, you ask the dumbest questions. My response was, well, that's why I'm a manager today. Remember, never think that you have to look smart at all times. The more you ask, the more you know. Just don't ask the same thing over and over again. Then you look really, really horrible. But yes, always, always strive. Wow. And always tell people, I need this. Amen. Just tell yeah. people I need this. I want to get to this job. I want to your job. What do I do? They will laugh, but they will always tell you what the secret. Everybody loves it when you ask. Please help me. And everybody wants to help. Yeah. It has been proven by the fact that an average person wants to help. And average, but we just think that they don't want to help. It has been proven by numerous decide that an average person doesn't really want to help. That mentorship is very, very important. All of us have mentors. May I had mentors since I was in Gambia, and I'm still in touch with them. I can call some names uh, offline. Mame Gillen has been very instrumental. Fabus, Ali, quite a number of them. I had a uh, Kumba Kebe, all these people. And here as well, I have my CFO, but I have my own personal mentor. After doing my appraisal with my CFO, I go back to that mentor, we discuss. We have a plan because I'm looking at something bigger. How do I prepare myself for those things? Most of the times, quite a number of jobs are taken before they go to the press. We know that. That's the fact. That's the relationship. There is a book by Kala Harris I was referring to, Strategize to Win. It's a very wonderful book. Kala Harris says that in organization, there are only two things that can help people to grow. It's your performance. She actually called them currencies. Performance currency and relationship currency. That relationship currency is that mentor, that coach, that sponsor. So that when people are sitting at the high table making decisions, there is somebody there who can talk on your behalf. Call them politics, call them anything. These things, they work. You need somebody who knows you. They won't give your name if they don't see your performance. So performance is the first thing. If they see you performing, but they need to support you to grow in that career. If they see there's an opportunity coming up, they say, oh, you know Fatima, she's very articulated. She's kind of managing relationship. Let's make her the branch manager. If management is in doubt, she will come and give life stories about what you have done. Not if, but not even your boss may do that. So don't over rely on your boss, your human resources, or your director that he or she is in charge of your growth. Your growth is personal. That's why they call it personal development. It's in your own hand. And you must take personal responsibility for it. I don't know if you have any questions, sorry, if I think we have a uh, time we'll spend 20 minutes into the time. Um, yes. So our panelists, if they are, they are all still available, everybody is busy. These are all busy executives. We are talking about chief auditors, CFOs, financial advisors. They are very busy, but 
I don't know if we still have times. And in terms of mentorship, I know I've spoken to the number of them on our panelists. We are planning to engage them to mentor, at least each of them, if they can mentor two people. So if you are interested in to be mentored by any of these people, they can take maximum of two. You can visit our site. We'll give you a link. You can register there. Then we are going to send a mail to all those who have registered so that we can connect these people with two people at a time and for them to mentor them over the next one year. And we want to make this program a formal mentorship program where we will follow up and see how best it is going to work or what is not working to benefit them as an individual. Again, your mentor, like Fatima said, is not that the person is going to do everything for you. You won't come and ask him, oh, what is accounting? What is our finance? You don't send him your homework. You don't send him your project. We are talking about sharing views with them, using them to share their experience with you, to, to share a problem with them where they can give you perspective and you take a final decision. All of us need mentors. Even the presidents, they have mentors. So nobody's above having that mentor. Salifu, what are your thoughts? I'm great. Um, I think um, the time is well spent. We are 50 minutes of the time now. Uh, sorry, 20 minutes. But I can gladly say that after discussing with the panelists, they've all accepted that they can't actually take two uh, mentors, ment uh, mentees um, to guide them, to, to make sure that they achieve their professional aspirations as professional accountants. But I have this lot of people asking me this question. When we talk about finance, are we talk talking about only accountants? This question is being asked so many times, but it's good to mention it here that it's not only people working in the finance department are deemed to be finance professional. Today here, it is well manifested that Nene is here as a chief auditor of, a, of an international bank, and she's, she's a finance professional. So indeed, I, can, I am so happy and glad that I've had so many good um, advices from, you know, Fatima, from Mars, um, and from Nene, that, and Mr. Kaira. And when we call on them, Mr. Sawane, it was so easy for them to respond. It was just a phone call and they accepted, which tells you that there is that hunger to help. Someone has said it. And they really want to support Gambian young professional. I am a young professional. I am being assisted. I, I can gladly say it again. Mr. Swa is actually part of um, the forum. He groomed me today to make me who I am. It was a short moment with him at Ecobank Gambia, but today I, am, I can proudly say that he is the one who made me who I am um, as a finance professional. Mr. Ibrahim, thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. And I hope that if we call on you again, it will just be a matter of a text or a phone call to answer on our call. Hand over to you, Mr. Sawane, and to your panelists um, for the conclusion. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Salif. You did mention about SUA. I mean, thanks again to Mr. SUA because he's one of the people who organized this event. We organized this thing on the IG Business and Finance, which events behind the scenes is myself, uh, Salif Ba, and Mr. SUA. We are looking for ways and opportunities to support young people in the country. What is telling us that it does not matter where we are located. And more of these events will be coming. We are still talking to other professionals who will be willing to come and talk to us. And like you said, our panelists, you can see, I don't think we even have doubt about that. When they are talking, you can see the person, you can see the precise nature of what they are saying, how practicable their information they share with us. So that shows us that they are prepared and they are willing to support whatever length they can to support the growth of young people in the country. So I will ask them to give us their final words of advice I mean, for, as far as this event is concerned. So for each of them, at least for one minute, I will start with uh, ladies first. So let me start with Sister Nene, Chief Odito. At least you will our work after we finish talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. As you can see, we're all very busy. What well, Definitely, this is an important course. So we will, of course, take the time to, to be part of it. And we are... Um, uh, we're available at all times whenever you call on us definitely this is an opportunity for us also to put back what we got from the system 
I always say we've still not done enough because somebody trained me to be where I am today. And we have not done the same to, to get younger people to, to where we are. So definitely we did need to do, we need to do more. So I'll just leave the audience with a quote from Martin Luther King, which said, Martin Luther King Jr., sorry, which says, if you cannot fly, then run. If you cannot run, then walk. If you cannot walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. So for me, that sums it all. So never settle, have that growth mindset, and then the sky is the limit. And as always, with the help from God, the possibilities are endless. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nini. You must be moving all the time. Mr. Kara, your last words, please. Thank you very much. Um, again, um, thank you, um, um, IG um, Business and Finance. Uh, this is a very great initiative, and um, we are always available uh, to share ideas, share our thoughts, and learn in the process. So, um, like I said, it's a continuous process. We've learned a lot, myself included. So it has to be that way. And um, my final um, word to those that aspire to be professionals someday is that if others have made it, you can surely make it. If others have made it, you can surely make it. You just have to bear that in mind. But if others have failed, then you also have to really plan yourself because if you slip, you may easily slide. So you cannot be overly confident. You have to be careful. But you can't also say you cannot make it. Others have made it. You can surely make it. Thank you. Wow. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, uh, there is always a clue. Whatever thing we, have, we want to do now, somebody has done it before. That's what uh, Dada just left with us. Some people have achieved it. We also can achieve it. Let me uh, ask uh, Fatima your last words, please, for today's webinar. Absolutely. And I really thank you for organizing this platform. My last words are, do not let every excuse stop you from succeeding. We all have excuses. Know your worth. Remember, simplicity is key. No jargons, no abbreviations. Make sure you use tables, graphs, and colors as your husband when you're trying to communicate. Get your basics right. Get your facts right. Get your skills right. Engage in forums like this and get a mentor. I cannot stress that enough. Get a mentor. The only way you're going to go forward is by getting a mentor. And teach one, each one. Anyone who has the skills, just teach one. Even if you think you haven't, whatever you learned, teach it. And that's the only way we can grow together. Thank you, thank you, Fatima. Let's teach one, each one. That's the multiplier effect. She's talking about imagine if each and every one of us here can just take one word here and share with somebody. It may be a student. The person may not even be a finance professional. The fact that Fatima said you need a mentor, whether someone is studying to be a medical doctor, someone is studying to be uh, in the agricultural field, to be a teacher, they all need mentor to be successful. So let's share the message and let's help them. It's, it's going to help them to grow. Uh, Mr. Manja, please share your closing remarks with us. Thank you. Um, so for me, it's um, staying focused on what you want to um, achieve. But I want to touch a little bit more on believing in yourself, that you can make it. Because I know as young people, sometimes we find ourselves in those um, situations where we get distracted. We get distracted because we're starting up in our careers and we have big ambitions, right? We want to settle in very quickly. We want to own our houses, um, drive big cars, and you know, do some fanciful jobs. So sometimes that could distract you from you know, getting the right skill set that will prepare you for the future. So you find a lot of young professionals moving, you know, you know organizations in a matter of two years, one year, they are moving around and you find themselves not really making much progress in terms of what they want to be. So I just want to um, appeal to a lot of young people who are following us that uh, it needs time, perseverance and staying focused on what you want to be. Every other thing will just fall in place in, in time. So these are sort of very important things I think need to um, revive and, and, and try to work on as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manjan. Thank you very much, Fatima, Dauda, and Nene. We are very grateful for giving us your time, 
sharing your experience with us and the many viewers around the globe. We are grateful once again. And for my own closing remarks, I want to talk to two groups of people, those who have the experience, who have the knowledge, please let's come out and help someone in the country and beyond the country. Because one thing I believe all of us, we have a purpose. And that purpose, if you look at the deeper end, is to make impact in our life. The legacy we're supposed to leave behind is not how much balance we leave in our bank account. It's not about how many compounds do we have. Our legacy should be how many people's life have we touched whilst we are alive. So it's important we think about that. For the young people who want to grow in finance, who want to learn about finance, it is important you understand that beyond the classrooms, you need to continue to grow. You need to continue to learn because that is that learning that will help you to grow further. You need to network. You need to prepare yourself. Do not just think about what you are seeing today. We've seen technology is changing so many things in finance. Data science has come in. Business partnering has come in. Effective presentations, communication. These are all important skills you need for you to be an effective finance professional. And one thing I can tell you, the business people, the business owners, the CEOs are looking for CFOs, finance professionals, who can use data, which is a fundamental skills, who can use finance data, tell stories, and enable them to make a decision. And to achieve that, your personal development is your personal responsibility. Thank you once again for joining us on this call. And I would therefore say bye-bye. And all of you, please stay safe, no matter where you are calling from. Thank you once again. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Boss. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.